All right, welcome to this keynote session, the new rules starting early when it comes to investing. I'm so pleased to bring in our panelists. We have Acorns founder and CEO, Noah Kerner, and BlackRock's Chief Marketing Officer, Frank Cooper. Welcome to you both. Thanks, Julie. Good seeing you, Julie. Yeah, both of you as well. Uh, let's start with the newest Acorns news that came out just last month. Um, Acorns Early. So for folks who aren't familiar, um, it's basically an investing app. Uh, you can explain it better, Noah, but I, I have Acorns and you get these roundups. Every time I purchase something, I get a roundup and it invests into a, a, an account for me. And you all are now starting from childbirth for people. Walk us through what Acorns does and where you saw this opportunity to get in really early. Yeah. Thanks, Julia. So in a nutshell, Acorns makes it really easy to save and invest small amounts of money over time. That's the, that's the basic sort of foundation of the product. And, and the idea is that small amounts of money add up over time, right? Through the power of compounding, dollar cost averaging, these kinds of things. So roundups is one of the ways you can contribute really easily. And we started there because spare change is something everybody has, everybody understands. You can sort of wrap your head around it. So it's easy to kind of think about Oh, I can I can give a little bit of spare change every time I make a purchase that gets added to a portfolio for me automatically invested and then adds up over time. And then there's lots of other ways to contribute. And we sort of take customers on a journey from there. You can start a retirement account. You can open up a full bank account where we have a debit card that saves and invests extra money for you while you spend. And like you just said, we recently launched Acorns Early, which allows our parent customers to open an Acorns account for their kids as early as birth. And from what we know, it's the easiest way to do it. If you're an Acorns customer, it's about 90 seconds to open this account for your kids. And the thing that's beautiful about it is obviously the earlier you start investing, the better off you are. So we're trying to get parents investing in kids as early as birth. And the power of compounding comes to life in a really significant way when you start as early as birth. So it's $5 a day invested in your kid at birth is 70000 by college, it's a million by 49, and it, and it can be over $4 million by retirement. Yeah, the numbers are certainly impressive. And when you say four, over 4 million by retirement, it's kind of like a no brainer why, why someone wouldn't do that. Um, Frank Cooper, for, for you, um, when I hear Noah talk about that and just the sheer numbers by something as simple as $5 a day translating to that, it kind of brings up the concept of generational wealth and, and creating generational wealth what kind of opportunity and what kind of gap is there to address uh, when it comes to investing? Well, well, well first, I mean, I, I think uh, early is a brilliant idea because, you know, most of us, by the time, if you know about investment at all, by the time you figure it out, um, it, it's late in the game. You know, you figure, oh, my God, I should have invested. I, if I would have started earlier, I would have saved uh, a ton of money. Um, and, you know, and human beings in general just have a hard time thinking about compound interest. And, and rather than think about it, getting people to actually do it to me is, is, is what's critical. And what I love about early, it's just encouraging um, people to do it. And so if you're young, you're born, you're not going to know anything about it. By the time you're 10, though, you can start to see the effect of it already. You know, your parents may have done it. Your grandparents may have done it. And so I think that's a, a, a powerful um, mechanism. And I think everyone has seen the, the, the examples of compound interest, you know, if someone you take three people, if someone starts saving $1,000 uh, a month uh, for 10 years and they, it's, they start at 25 um, and, and um, you know, they earn a certain amount of money, they put it into an investment account at 35. Someone starts at 35, they put it in when they're 45. Another starts at 45 and put it, put it in when they're 55. They all retire, let's say, at 65. The outcomes are so different um, is what's remarkable to me. The person who started at 25 and saved for that first 10 years, they, they all saved the same amount but it started earlier, that person has about $1.5 million. Um, the other person who started at 35 only has about 740,000. And then the final person ends up with 370,000. As we are living longer, that extra money is going to be absolutely necessary. So starting earlier, earlier is absolutely critical to my mind. Um, one of the things I'm concerned about though, is that um, this is applied in a way that addresses some of the structural gaps that exist in society. And if you look across they're underrepresented communities that um, have structural barriers. Part of it is just knowledge, but part of it, part of it is the the um, uh, communities in which they live make it more difficult for them to have access to credit, have access to insurance at favorable rates, have access to investment vehicles. 
um, I feel like early is one of those ideas that that kind of democratizes and equal you know, creates an equal playing field um, because the 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 barrier to entry is really low. Now, the amount that you can invest uh, is low enough where anyone, virtually anyone, can participate in it. So I think this is a step toward it. It won't solve generational wealth, but it's a step toward addressing the 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 barriers to entry that I think have affected many communities of color in particular. Yeah, I, I like that you brought up uh, the democratizing of it and uh, addressing the various uh, barriers to entry. Um, Noah, what can you kind of tell us about your customers, what you have seen, and maybe even the challenge um, that you are addressing? Is there some sort of issue around customer inertia? Because when I hear this, I know it's a new product, but when I think about it, I'm like, wow, I'm 32, but wow, if I had gotten started investing when I was, you know, age 10, or if my, uh, you know, someone set up an account for me, how much of a difference that would make? How what are what is the challenge there? And also speak to the customer base. Yeah, so for almost half of our parent customers today, they're not saving and investing for their kids, and then and then the group that are the half that are nearly half that are more than half of them are not investing for their kids. So when you do the math on it, it's a very small percentage of people who are investing and a very small percentage of people who are taking advantage of compounding. So the large majority of parents who are, at least of our customers who are saving for their kids are doing it in cash um, and savings accounts. And, and, and you know, you know that, that creates a disadvantage and again, kind of contributes to the lack of level playing field over time. So you said, if you thought about if every American parent started uh, an investment account for their kid as early as birth or, you know, or sometime early on in childhood and made a commitment to contributing regularly, which we automate, that would profoundly change the country. A couple bucks a day, right? 25 bucks a week. Um, try to start with some amount and then, and then contribute regularly. That would really change things in a, in a meaningful way. And to your point, like I, I love it when we, you know, we have, we have 60 year old customers who start saving for retirement on acorns and that's wonderful. Um, we have a 98 year old customer who's saving and investing for her future, which is wonderful. Right. But, you know, if we can get her saving for her grandkids and her great grandkids, then we can change the future. Yeah. So um, really just fascinating stuff. Um, you know, Frankie, you kind of brought something up and I, I want to I want to explore this idea with you because you have this experience as a chief marketing officer across different industries. And when you kind of think about marketing, it brings up the notion of culture and how do we get culture to move in this direction and kind of rethink financial services and financial well-being and just money in general and get people more comfortable you know talking about it or making that part of your making that part of your well-being and your lifestyle yeah you, you know look i think wherever we've seen a, a shift in society where people have advanced uh in, in terms of their wealth um and, and their income in general it's usually based on knowledge and skills and um and again, going to back back to early, what I like about it is that it's focusing on the action first before the thinking. Um, if you want to get people to think their way into action, particularly around money, you're going to have a really difficult time because we don't talk about money. Um, you know, in polite conversation, we don't talk about money. You can go through an entire uh, 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 12 years, 14 years, 16 years of education and never have anyone tell you about how to have a healthy relationship with your money. It just doesn't exist in, in, our, in our curriculum. And so um, what I'm seeing is, is this, is I, as I look at all the well-being movements that have happened over time, the well-being movement in fitness, the well-being movement in nutrition, the well-being movement in mindfulness, we are now getting a broader understanding across virtually every region of the world that uh, our well-being um, is tied to those kinds of things. We, we now need to go to that last frontier, money. Uh, it's the number one source of stress. Um, you know, over 60% of people have cried in the past year over money. And you might say, oh, that's just people who, are, who don't have money. Actually, 41% of those earn $200,000 or more per year. It's, it's the number one source of stress. We don't know how to deal with, with it. We don't have the language for it. I think we're in a moment in time now where people realize that their relationship with money is going to be critical. But we need the language for it. Um, what does it mean to, um, um, to earn your money in a way that actually makes you feel more fulfilled and energized? How should you spend your money? It'd be great if you could spend your money and it gets rounded up and it gets put into an investment account. You do something you love and it actually benefits you for the long term. Um, you know, how should you think about saving and investing? How should you think about giving your money? That full spectrum 
is 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 what constitutes personal well-being, and um, and we need greater facility around understanding that, and we need to introduce that into culture. I I spent a lot of time in music, and I believe that music has done damage uh, to people's perception of their relationship with money. Um, you know, if you go way back in the '60s, it was more about scarcity. I don't have money. Uh, I want money. Get to the '70s, it's like it's a rejection of it for a second. Money is is the root of all evil. Get to the '90s, it's the bling culture. You know, uh, um, we're now at a point where I feel like um, pop culture is starting to rethink that. And uh, and I'm I'm looking at the lyrics and hearing uh, you know more songs that address it in a much broader sense. When I see Twenty One Savage out giving financial literacy courses, I'm actually encouraged by that because that means. The, it's it's in entering the vernacular of pop culture. This idea that having a healthy relationship with money is part of your overall well being. Yeah. And by the way, if you go if you go all the way back to the beginning, money was the great unifier. It was the the thing that brought people together through trade and barter. You know, well, barter preceding money, but it was the thing that brought people together. Now it's become this divider, right? And it's a sort of an irony built into that. And I, and I, you know, the, 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 the growing wealth gap, obviously we're seeing it every day, but this, this creating this incredible rift in our society, that's not sustainable, but it is ironic when you go all the way back to the, to, to the beginning, it was, it was the thing that brought people together from different places. Yeah. And for both of you, um, because it does bring up financial literacy and, and how we go about that. Do we need a fundamental rethink of what financial literacy means? And has financial literacy been effective? Because it's something that's been talked about for so long, but has it actually been effective? And how can it be more effective? I, I think Frank's point was like spot on. And that's what we, what we do at Acorns. We talk about making big decisions small. We get you to take an action that's going to help you. So we get you to, we try to get you to sign up for early and take an action to help you and then bring financial literacy into the equation. And that, that moment when you take an action and you set an, up an account like early and you start investing in your kids, that's the moment, that's the opportunity to really start diving into education and, and bring someone in and down that path. Like I, we were just talking about that the other day on that account screen, right? As soon as that account is open, that, is where literacy can start happening because you've got someone captive, they're thinking about this, and now you can bring them down that path and journey and open up this whole universe for people that they didn't know before. But you've got to get them to take action first because learning about money, financial education, right. it is one of the most boring, no matter, you know, it's one of the most boring things in the world and really hard to, to learn, really hard to retain. It's a yeah. fair point, yeah. Yeah, and you don't you don't know uh, this whole idea of doing first and learning second um, is incredibly powerful. And if you looked at the fitness movement and and how that works, no one ever said, "I'm going to teach you uh, running literacy." You know, hey, move your left arm and your and your and your right leg will should match that, and then move your right arm, your left leg. No one cares about that. You start doing it, and and you 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 get an emotional reaction from that, and then you want to learn more. You want to learn, oh, maybe I should change my gear. Maybe I should go deeper into it. I think it's the same thing in, in financial literacy. But I think there's one more step we, we should take, and you guys are doing it at Acorns, which I love, is, is uh, treating it in ways that um, people want to learn today and how people learn today. They learn through short form. They learn through mobile. They learn through visual experiences. They learn by stripping away all the jargon and just getting at what's really simple and intuitive for people. Um, you know, that's how people want to learn. They don't want to have a long white paper with a thousand footnotes. You know, give it to them in bite-sized portions that they can understand, and most importantly, that they can share so that you can then form a community around it so you can learn from each other. I think that's a really good point, Frank, because it kind of reminds me of just the fitness movement and following fitness influencers and learning different tricks and tips, whereas it was so taboo to talk about money. But what you're kind of saying there is just the small mobile format community it makes a lot of sense where you can actually have the meaningful conversation and not feel like shame around talking about money. That's right. That's right. Someone's going to say, someone is going to say one day, I started on Acorns when I was five years old. I'm a, I'm a millionaire now at, at, at 25. You know, someone's going to say that. It's going to happen um, because uh, uh, it's built for that. And, and um, once someone sees that, they're like, wow, I want to know more about that. And, yeah. and maybe I'll try and, and, and jump in. Uh, we learn from each other in that way. Mm -hmm. Then another thing for you guys, because Noah, you brought this up. You said you have a 98 year old on there still investing for her future. When we think of the concept of retirement, 
sometimes I'll just say personally, sometimes that just feels so far away. I know it's really not that far away, but do we need to rethink the notion of retirement? This is a question for both of you guys. Yeah, I mean, we did. So we call our retirement product Acorns Later uh, for, 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 for various reasons. But we began with retiring the word retire because it's like, you know, I don't, I don't know about you guys. I don't plan to retire. I love to work. Yeah. I think we're in a different time where people are starting things. They're pursuing their passions in a different way. You know, work culture and work opportunities provide that. Also, I just don't think we're going to have the kind of um, safety nets that we had before with Social Security and things like this. So people, it will be harder to retire. So we called it acorns later because we thought it was more fitting for the time and 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 the notion that you know this is money for you to have a better life later and then there's also an account for you to start investing in the near and midterm. Yeah, and, and retirement was um, in some ways a cynical idea when you think about it, right? Uh, it was based on the notion that you will turn 65 and you retire. Well, they picked 65 because most people died by that time, and they're like, you know what, you know, you work until you die, essentially. You know, maybe you get a couple of years of of of, of some uh, freedom and, and and some ability to enjoy your life. But for the most time, you're gonna work, 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 take off, say I'm retired, and then die. Cynical idea. Um, um, today, people are, are smarter than that. And they're saying a couple of things. They're saying one, you know what? I'm not gonna stay in one job the entire time. I'm gonna probably take a sabbatical here. I'm gonna change careers. I may change industries. Um, that's one, but two, I'm gonna live a lot longer. Um, you know, um, 50% of the people born in the U.S. today will likely live to 100 or more, um, just born today. And, um, you know, assuming that you know, we, we stay on the, on the right path. Um, and if you're going to live that much longer, what does that mean? Are you going to golf that much from 65 to, to, to 100? You're going to go fishing that much? You, you want to be, you, I think you want to be productive still. And I think we can learn a lot from uh, Okinawa, you know, where, uh, you know, where they have that principle of uh, Ikigai, where it's, it's, a, it's purpose basically infused in people's lives from an early, early stage um, where they feel like I'm contributing to something bigger than myself throughout my entire life. And you carry that through to every job. And even if you finish what you consider your main uh, uh, career, you'll still carry that principle with you. And, and that's, that's why I think purpose is so important today. It's not just for purpose-driven leaders and companies. It's for people in general to find that connection point to uh, the work that they're doing so they can carry that through their entire life. I really like what you just said about purpose and we only have a couple minutes. So I'm going to pose a final question for both of you and I'll, I'll give you the time to kind of flesh out your answer and maybe we can bring up purpose, for example. Um, we've gone through a health crisis. We're still going through a health crisis, an economic crisis, a social crisis as it relates to racial inequality in this country. And I just want to step back and think about the opportunity um, to close some of these gaps, the wealth gap, the investing gap, and some of the challenges that it could help solve for. If we could kind of explore that and maybe what your moonshot is or what you kind of hope for in the future, what kind of, um, you know, maybe tie it back to purpose, kind of the work that you all want to do as it relates to some of those challenges. Yeah. Frank, I'll go, I'll go first real quick. Um, I did this exercise. I always encourage people to do it. I did this exercise at one point and I sat down and I, I sort of wrote my, what I thought my purpose should be, um, you know, as a purpose statement and, and it's sort of oriented around professional life. And I, and I said, leveling the playing field that felt like this is a really good place for me to spend time. And, and, and it feels like I can, I can contribute the most by focusing on that. So at Acorns, we have this ambition, we call it an ambition of 100 million everyday Americans saving and investing every day. That's my hope. My hope is that we get to a place where 100 million everyday Americans are saving and investing every day. And that doesn't mean that we have to have all 100 million of them on Acorns. Uh, I would like to have 100 million of them on Acorns. But, but if, we, if we can be part of this movement forward to help inspire this type of action um, and this type of behavior, that would feel really meaningful and and fulfilling yeah i mean i don't have much to add to that. i think i think that to me is an awesome uh um, goal and, and aspiration and, and the way i think about it is very similar to noah um can we expand the potential of people by giving them real pathways so they can move forward no matter where they are um to me the, the most important thing today is to make sure that no matter where someone stands you know if they're in extreme poverty or whether they're uh, um, you know, graduating from college and, and rising, that they feel like they can take a step forward and they actually can make uh, a step toward improving their, their lives. And some of these gaps are, are, 
are um, scary in, in, in some sense. If you look at Boston, for example, the average net worth of a black American in Boston is $8. The average net worth of a white American in Boston is two hundred forty-seven thousand. Um, as Noah said earlier, these are not sustainable. These gaps, and I think what we're seeing across the world is everyone saying the same thing: Al allow me to participate in the prosperity that I'm seeing only a few people enjoying. Allow me to, to take that step forward. Uh, and they need the knowledge, they need the skills, and they need the platform, and they need to start early. And so, so I think um, um, for me, I'm excited about whatever vehicles allow them to take those positive steps forward. And, and I feel like early is one of them, I, and Acorns is one of the platforms. It's one of the reasons why I'm so excited to be a part you know, of, of, and I told Bill of this uh, many times, um, You know, I, I feel like it's a privilege to be a part of that because I actually think it's gonna be one of the critical vehicles to allow people to do that. Mm -hmm. Well, gentlemen, it has been a privilege to be part of this conversation. Noah Kerner, the CEO of Acorns, and Frank Cooper, the Chief Marketing Officer of BlackRock. I thank you both for your time and wonderful discussion, and thank you to all of the viewers at home. Julia, great seeing you. Thanks so much. Thank you, guys.